Good morning and welcome to In Church at Home. It is so good to have you join us online for church this morning. Let's pray and then we'll uh, get into our time together. Father, we thank you and we praise you for your goodness toward us. We thank you for so many ways in which your grace and your mercy come our way. Lord, we thank you for the fact that you are the God that never leaves us and never forsakes us. Lord, we thank you for the ways that we see and in so many ways that we do not see that your hand of protection is upon us. We thank you for your Holy Spirit who leads us and guides us and is our help and our strength. Father, I particularly pray today for all of those who are watching online that, Lord, you would lift up sp any spirits that are downcast, that, Lord, you would encourage and that, your Lord, you would um, cause, Lord, hope and faith to be stirred. Father, I thank you and I praise you for your love and for your mercy. Uh, Lord, I pray today that, Lord, your presence would minister and that, Lord, your word would do that for which it is spoken. I thank you, Father, and I pray in Jesus' name. And everyone said or typed on the chat, Amen. Well, it's so good to have you online. And of course, uh, today at In Church Melbourne, it's a special day. Uh, in the live service that's happen happening today, it's our Heart for His House Sunday. And next Sunday, we'll broadcast. Uh, the message that I'm uh, sharing today. Uh, but, but in this service, we are uh, broadcasting the message that David Gooey uh, shared last week. And uh, it, I asked David to bring a word preparing us. And uh, I, you know, I love David, I love his heart, I love the, the, uh, the depth of his faith and the creativity of his mind. And I know that you're going to be blessed by the word that's coming up in a, in a few moments. Hey, I wonder, have you received Jesus as your Lord and Saviour, but not yet been baptised? On Sunday, the 6th of November, we have our next water baptism uh, service. And if you would like to be water baptised, then can I encourage you today to fill in the online uh, form. The details will be on the screen. Um, or if you receive e-news, there's a, a link in e-news that you can just uh, press the button. It'll take you to the form. Um, I'm asking for you to fill that in today because we want to make contact with you and uh, prepare you uh, for that. The baptisms will happen uh, after church next Sunday at our home at One Ashmere Court, Caroline Springs. Um, and so uh, if you'd like to be baptised, we'd be honoured uh, to enable that to happen. Today, we are taking up a miracle offering for the future of In Church Melbourne. Of course, um, the last couple of years, we have been raising funds for our land and building fund. And we are believing for God to literally open a door for a new home for our church. Uh, to date, uh, since the church began, we've been using uh, rented facilities and those facilities have meant that we've always had to set up uh, and then pack down again. We've not had facilities that have been ours 24 seven. And it's time for us to come into a home of our own. We know that uh, council has advised us that um, Burnside, uh, it looks as though will be made available to us in 2023, but that will be in a modified form. The service is time is gonna need to change. Uh, we're going to have some changes with regards to kids church, and uh, we'll be advising those changes uh, in the next uh, couple of months uh, before the start of 2023. And, uh, and we know that next year is it. The council has let us know that after 2023, we won't be able to use the facilities anymore. And so we need breakthrough. And so we're asking uh, the whole church today 
to give to our land and building fund. We've been praying about this for many months now. Uh, we've been uh, building up through uh, a, a daily devotional the last couple of weeks. And so today's the day. And so uh, with you uh, being involved in church online, how can you give your uh, Heart for His House offering? Well, it's really easy. There are two ways that you can do that. The first way is, and the details are now on the screen, you can deposit via EFT, electronic funds transfer, straight to the land and building fund and the uh, BSB and account number is there. In fact, that's the easiest way. There are no fees attached to that, very secure, just from your bank account straight to the church's bank account. And that's the, that's the best way to give uh, today. However, if you're giving via a credit card or debit card, then uh, using uh, Tithely, and again, the details are on the screen right now, uh, choosing uh, the land and building fund uh, option in the drop down screen and then either choosing one off or regular giving, putting in the amount. Now, Tithely is safe and secure. Uh, in fact, hundreds and hundreds of churches around Australia use Tithely. It's a great system and uh, um, we, uh, we value that. If you are able to cover the fees, uh, that certainly helps the church, but if not, that's no problem. Um, and uh, and that's the other way that you can easily give to Heart for His House, the miracle offering today. And uh, of course, uh, just two weeks ago, the church received uh, outside, from someone outside of the congregation, uh, someone uh, wanted to anonymously give $100,000 to spur us on as a congregation toward our goal of raising $1 million. And uh, we're, we're so grateful to that. And I hope you've been encouraged by that uh, as Melissa and I have. Well, family, um, it's a great day, a great day for the life of our church. We're believing uh, for good things ahead. But right now, the man of God, David Gooey, is coming to bring the word of God. Hey, God bless you and uh, hope to see you real soon. And God, is, I'm just reminded many years ago, that if it's one for your goodness, I wouldn't be even standing here today alive. If it's one for your wonderful grace and mercy, Lord, I wouldn't have the family I have today to even to step into this very land. Because God, my life was filled with a sense of despair and hopelessness. But in you, oh God, your goodness has made it all possible. Your grace has made it all the more overwhelmingly true and real that you are alive and you can turn around a life that's filled with so much despair into a life of hope and a life of new beginning and that, and that this life will continue to get better and better and better each day. As your word says, your mercies are new every morning. Help us to see the reality of your love. And oh God, we ask that you will cause our hearts to be open to you, Lord, even right now. Lord, cause your hearts to be, cause our hearts to be open, to know your heart, to hear your voice. And Lord, even in right, right now, we ask, dear Spirit of God, that cause a stillness to rest upon us. There's, there's your peace that we will truly, Lord, hear your still and loving voice, Lord. Thank you, oh God. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Please be seated. I'm David. Uh, by the way, if you haven't caught up, um, you haven't caught up who I am, just a normal average guy, just to be really, really clear, I'm not a pastor. I'm just a guy who, who's got a job, who's got a family, who has to earn a wage and uh, has to face all the things that we deal with, children, marriage, personal struggles, and all that sort of stuff. So I'm coming from a position that I'm just like um, everyday Joe, like you, like all of you sitting here. But um, so Pastor Craig has entrusted me to actually share this morning. Cool. I just want to start off um, by asking this question to every one of us. How many of, how many of you uh, would say that you are an investor? Put up your hand. Investor. Okay. Cool. 
That's just uh, on probably about 10%. Okay. I'm, I'm going to make a statement with, with my starting um, um, sharing, which is God is an investor. But guess what? Because God is an investor, he expects the resources he put into, put to work, to multiply. And why I say that? I didn't say that because it's, it's David's smart idea. It's actually God's smart idea in Matthew chapter 13, verse 23, where Jesus says, The seed that fell on good soil represents those who truly hear and understand God's word and produce a harvest of 30, 60, or even 100 times as much as had been planted. Since we are created in his image, we are also investors ourselves. Okay, let me repeat it. Since we are created in God's image, we are also investors ourselves. So now let me ask you the question. How many of you are investors? Great. And I want to speak from, from a financial sense because I think the first time when I asked the question, you guys who put up probably understand it from a financial aspect. Because like a, with a when you do a financial investment, when we put in something, we want to see a return. And not only, not only do we want to see a return, we want to see a huge return. That, that's a good financial sense when you invest. The last thing you want is we, we make a loss. And even not so great is actually we break even. Do you know that God is the same? Because God is a, if God is an investor, he's not a bad investor. He's actually a good investor. And in Matthew chapter 25, verse 14 to 30, which is not on the slide, Caroline, don't worry, is the parable of the three servants. It's a pretty long, long um, passage, but I just want to summarize. It talks about a master going away and he had three servants that he, he was going to get them to invest. So he gave one servant with one bag of silver, the second servant with two bags of silver, and the third servant with five bags of silver. Then he said he will go away and he expect them to actually put, put, to be put to work to multiply it. Guess what? Two of them, the two back and the five back servant, came back and multiplied twice. So two, the two backs make it four back and the five back made it five more backs. But the one, one back servant decided, nah, stuff it. I'll just keep it. I'll just hide it. Then when the master comes back, I'll just return his one back of silver. But guess what? God, the, the master wasn't happy. He was really unhappy in, in the situation of a break-even scenario. And it's the same with God too. And we have to ask ourselves the question is, what are you investing in? Or the most fundamental investment question we have to ask ourselves as human beings, are we investing in something with eternal or limited value? People throughout history have worked really hard to build wealth, dynasties, Establish great businesses so that they can it can last outlast them and, and continue to, to to outlast into many generations. But like all of us know that throughout history, people in the past that we have learned through history and people today is that at some stage people are just gonna forget forget about you. Even if I were to ask my par uh, if I were to ask my contemporaries or uh, my relatives, my cousins, my nephews and niece and said, oh, remember great-grandfather when he actually came all the way from, from China to, to establish a better life in Malaysia? All the wealth you guys enjoy, do you still remember him? To, to be true, to be honest, most of them wouldn't, to, wouldn't remember what grand, great-grandfather has done. Literally, I don't think any of them remember what his name is too. And that shows how short the human memory is in terms of remembering what people have done. But guess what? God has, has put it within us a desire for eternity. Because God is eternal. And He actually, when He breathed into us, He breathed into His eternal life into us. And where we, where we know that when we engage with God and when we find God, He becomes the source of everything we ever wanted. And reading from Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 11, He says, or, or, the, or the, the writer of Ecclesiastes, the smartest man in the world, or the wisest man in the world says, God has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the human heart. Yet no one can phantom what God has done from beginning to end. 
But the opposite is true when we disconnect ourselves from God, which means we disconnect ourselves from everything. And this, this, this is a bit of a, a, a side, side note. In Romans chapter 3, verse 23 says that, by default, the truth is that we are all born sinful and messed up. And we have, because, we have, we have, because someone has stuff up, we have, we have continued to inherit that corruption in our lives called sin. And what that does is that it not only messes up, but, but it also causes us to mess up our lives and to mess up the people around us. But today I want to, um, today I want to talk about investment, but I want to talk about something else that is hardly preached. But let, 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 let me define investment. When we, when we invest in something, no, whether you, you like it or not, as probably all of us, all of us know, that when we, we, we're actually investing, and we do so by committing our resources. Because when you invest, you actually put in resources. But resources is not financial only. Resources mean your time, your talents, your gifts, your relationship, your experience, and also the knowledge that you have. So for example, when you're studying, it's actually investment. You have to put in effort, you have to put in time, you have to bust your brain to, to absorb the information and to try to do tests which you say, what, what is this all about? That's investment. At the, same, at, at the same time, things like when you attend different activities, cooking dinner for your family is investment. Befriending a person is also investment. Going to work is investment. Watching that series on Netflix is also an investment of your time and your resources because you have to pay the bill to be able to watch it. That's also your money. Whether you like it or not, you are investing into some, in something. Today, the topic is going to be about covetousness. That's a bit too old-fashioned name. But the modern word is actually greed. Does a greedy person mean that the person who, who loves money more than anything else or the person you see in the buffet that gobbles down everything like no, no tomorrow? Is that a greedy person? Let's, let, let's play a video, the first video, and see what's, uh, um, yeah, just, just see what, let's see the, the first video. Ready? Yeah. Yeah. Oh my God! Black Friday isn't quite what it used to be. Back in 2014, people would do anything to bag a bargain. <laughs> Police had to be called to a number of mini riots across the UK as customers battled over discounted Polaroid TVs. <laughs> Staff in supermarkets were powerless to prevent the frenzy. Some relied on clever tactics to secure a deal. Here one customer throws her purchase to a friend closer to the till. For the most part, however, it was a case of brawn over brains. Even the police struggled to detach determined shoppers from their prize fines. With many stores moving their Black Friday sales online, there's unlikely to be a repeat of these scenes in 2019. Still, what would Christmas be without the occasional good-natured disagreement? Interesting. We, we, we laugh about it, actually. Yeah, it's interesting. We, we actually laugh about this thing. Some of us actually witnessed it. I actually did witness some of this a few years ago before all this crazy stuff of Black Friday happens. I want to define why is a greedy person. A greedy person will never be content with anything despite having more than enough. The person is not able or willing to control their desire and want anything that they find interesting right now. Greed is simply you want to have everything, own everything and be everything. It will never be enough and you will be satis dissatisfied in the long term. And for those who have earned, who have um, owned cars, the first, the first day, woo, it's wonderful. You, you want to drive it every day. Give it one week. Uh, okay, I'll drive it five days. Give it one month. Ah, oh, I want the new car because 
how say carexpert.com just came out a review of the latest new car that just that, that you're you're interested and you're really thinking about buying that car. And, and and that's one thing that we have to watch out. And greed is not a character traits only, but it's one's relation to people in life. The person will see someone as a potential potential catch, an opportunity to prey and to exploit. But that person also do display extreme competitiveness. They would usually justify their greed under the guise of being better than others, hence having the natural right of owning something that is not currently theirs. There's a saying there's some truth to it. There's a sufficiency in the world for man's needs, but not for man's greed. Most of the time, we can actually tell a person's character and personality by the things they own. The clothes they wear, the car they drive, the house they live in, and the decoration even when, when, you, when you visit their, their home, the hobbies that they enjoy doing, the restaurants they eat in, and also, just now what we see, the items that people are willing to kill up overnight for, to fight over on opening day. We live in a consumer world where all the marketing campaigns done by small and large companies says that if you don't buy our product, your life is incomplete, your life is not good enough. Let's watch the next video. Well, they are the latest version of Air Jordan sneakers to hit the streets, and they're already proving to be quite popular. We found some people who couldn't wait to get their hands on them today. Check this out here. A crowd of shoppers rushing through the entrance at Eastland Mall in East Columbus this morning, knocking the doors right off their hinges. Extra police officers had to be called out to help with the crowd control here as people waited for the doors to open. Employees at the Champs Sports Store inside the mall were handing out vouchers for the shoes. Shoppers will have to return next week to pick them up. Now, it doesn't appear that anyone was hurt during this mad dash into the mall this morning. A pair of those new shoes, by the way, costs 170 bucks. Air Jordan craze, this was back in 2013, and this continued to happen even till today. Do you think buying the, the latest Air Jordan is going to make you and suddenly an embodiment of Michael Jordan on the NBA court? Of course, you laugh about it. But why would, why would those people be doing that when you think about it? Yes, I'm aware that there's commodity value in owning uh, Air Jordan sneakers. Some of these people will say it's an investment portfolio. But the majority of those people that actually buy it, actually they're driven by pride and greed. Because they say that if I own it, guess what? I'm better than you who, who don't own it. Let's read, um, let me read from Acts chapter 4, verse 32 to 35. All the believers were united in heart and mind, and they felt that what they owned was not their own, so they shared everything they had. The apostles testified powerfully to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and God's great blessing was upon them all. There were no needy people among them, because those who owned land or houses would sell them and bring the money to the apostles to give those in need. Just a warning, I'm not telling you to sell your houses and everything you own, okay? But what I'm trying to do, to stress and emphasize is that you start to wonder why today's church seems powerless and lacks significant influence in, in the society today. It's partly, if, if you actually read it through and you are being honest about it, if you look at the church across the world, we seem to be, we, we don't seem united enough. We hardly share our resources. We, do, we rarely care for people in need. We talk too much of the less important things and we talk too little of the things that truly matters to God and we don't do enough of the right thing. If we are, if we are really, really honest with ourselves as a, as a church. Greed is like cancer. What is cancer? Cancer is, is essentially an, exist, an existing healthy cells in your body that decides that, okay, I'm the, for example, I'm the tissue of the liver. Thought, okay, I'm sick of being the liver. I want to take over the body. It's filled with uh, pride, so to speak. And I'm going to, not only that, I'm going to take over the, the rest of the body. I'm going to corrupt the rest of the body. Hence why cancer is really hard to detect. Because it comes from your body itself. And it's just a, the DNA in it decided that, guess what? I'm not going to be liver. I want to be everything else of the body. 
and it kills the rest of the body. And by the time you actually find out about it, it's generally a bit too late. But with modern technology, we are, so, we are able to pick it up through, through testings where you're able to go deep into the DNA testing to know that, oh yeah, it's cancerous. But greed is like that. And greed is subtle too. Like cancer is subtle too, until it's too late. We use, some, some of us use excuses to, to hide greed. Say that, oh, I'm human. I'm really hungry or hangry. It's, um, it's no harm taking more than more than now, because uh, no one is going to look after me. And the most the the one that I hear it very often, one last time, one last time, or one second last time, and repeat it again. The forever one last time request, or forever one last time uh, favor. Or the worst I've heard, even heard is that God won't mind, won't mind it because he owns everything. So what, what, what does it do to him if I steal or take that little bit of amount? The only reason that God has an issue is that it actually, the, the reality it doesn't do anything to him. That's correct. But he actually impacts us a lot more than you think. Instead, he actually takes us on a journey of spiraling towards destruction. That's where you be here. And even as, I still remember not a few years ago in 2019, before the pandemic, where in my workplace, I was, I was able to go into a breakout room and sit and have lunch with, with my colleagues to actually catch up. The guy that was sitting next to uh, the next table, li little did I know that in one year's time, he's going to appear in the newspaper saying that he has, has, has embezzled a fair bit of amount, about one point something over a million dollars off the company. He didn't have sign writing I'm greedy or greedy in progress on his forehead. He just did it. And little did, did, did we know that, yeah, and, and it was really interesting time. And I want to read from um, Mark chapter 7, verse 18, 23, the MSG version. Just to be mindful, MSG version is not the, the monosode the glutamate or the flavor enhancer, for those who don't know, is the message paraphrase. But I would say it's got, got a bit of kick to it. It's got a bit of umami to it. Let me read. Jesus said, are you being willfully stupid? Don't you see that what you swallow can't contaminate you? Wow. It doesn't enter your heart but your stomach. Works its way through the intestines and is finally flush. That took care of dietary quibbling. Jesus was saying that all foods are fit to eat. He went on, it's what comes out of a person that pollutes, obs that pollutes obscenities, lust, thefts, murders, adulteries, greed, what we are talking about, depravity, deceptive dealings, carousing, mean looks, slander, arrogance, foolishness. All these are vomit from the heart. There is the source of your pollution. Really, really blunt. Really, really blunt. So Jesus is trying to say that greed along with all those sinful stuff is not a mental or physical problem. It's in fact a heart issue. So a greedy person is not a greedy person mentally or physically. But as a greedy person is how say a greedy person is a greedy person at heart. Ephesians chapter five, verse five says, you can be sure that no immoral, impure, or greedy person will inherit the kingdom of Christ and of God. For a greedy person is an idolater worshipping the things of this world. So uh, it's, it's, it's a pretty serious thing when, about greed. But guess what? Let's, let's not stop there. God, one, one thing about God is that God is, God is light. And what light does is it reveals what is true and the reality of the situation. But what light doesn't, doesn't just do is that he actually allows the loving hands of God to actually work to resolve the situation with you. And I'm going to share the main, ver the main verse or the main passage of my message, which is Colossians chapter 3, verse 5 to 17. Okay. That's gonna, it's quite a, quite a fair bit of verse to read. It starts with, Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of this, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must also rid yourselves of all such things as this, anger, rage, 
malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other, which is being renewed in the knowledge in the, is in the image of his creator. Here there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian or Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all as, and is in all. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has any grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you, and over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you will call to peace, and be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. For those who, who's got this passage, you'll be no harm to actually um, keep, um, how say, keep tabs on it, because what I'm going to do is that how do, I'm going to share is that how are you going to defeat the cancer of greed? There's, I'm going to share eight combo tools. And what I mean by combo tools is that you have to use all eight co tools. It's a bit like getting a happy meal without the happy parts. It doesn't make sense. You, you have to get all the parts, or else it wouldn't be called happy meals. So these eight tools is quite a fair bit, but it's, it's something that, that we constantly have to deal with because like, if you were to speak to any doctors, when they have to treat cancer, it's not like cancer is like, oh yeah, here you go, just pop a pill. That's it, you should be able to do the job. It's a multiple approach that a doctor has to use to actually treat cancer. And greed, like cancer, is a big thing too. It's a big thing, it's a big deal to God. And let me start with uh, tool number one. Always come to God in repentance. What does repentance mean? Repentance is basically saying that, God, I've got an issue here. I need your help. And can you help me? And I do real, and you also have to say it, you have to be really honest, say that, God, I really know this is a problem. This is a sin. It really, um, you're, you're definitely not happy with it. And once you acknowledge it, you say, God, I really need help. That's basically repentance. It's not, a, yes, it sounds a fancy word, but it's the one of the most important thing. You will, you read through the Bible. Whenever someone, you see some, how someone turn over their life, or from a, from a moment of, yeah, gone case situation where they can no longer, the thing that will allow them to be able to actually get out of the, the pickle that they are in is literally repentance. Because repentance says that, stop, turn back and say, God, this is a problem. Help me because I am really helpless. That's the first two. First two in anything that, that we do when it comes to, to dealing with an issue. Two number, um, two number two, which is found in verses five and eight. Put to death earthly sinful nature, meaning getting rid of any negative behavior in attitude, actions, and words, especially towards people. And we have to actually, and how do you put to death something? And God actually has provided a way, which is actually at the cross where we say, God, I have this problem here. Can you put it to death? Because to kill something like cancer is that the, the best thing to, to defeat cancer is to actually kill it. And we have to put it to death. And God has provided a way for us. And, and with it, we know that, that, that God, that I need this to die so that I can live. Two number three, verses 10 to 11. Because you put something to death is one thing. You actually have to put on the new, new thing, the new self, the, the identity in God. Because we need to constantly renew our identity in God by growing in the knowledge, in the image of God, our Creator, through the Bible. The only way we know our identity, our new life, is actually through the Bible, the revelation, the truth, the information. But guess what? We also have to realize is that God does not discriminate anyone, and we are all on the same level playing field. Do you know that? There's no, there's no one who is more inferior or superior than us. God has made it all a level playing field for, for us. Because Christ is for all and is in all, as what the verses say. 
That's two number three. Two number four, verse 12. Behave according to your identity in God. So, okay, it's great. You know who you are in Christ. Act like one. Because God tells us to be compassionate in the verse. Kind, humble, gentle, and patient. But the best way to actually show it is to actually give people slacks to make mistakes and to even hurt us sometimes. Because guess what? God gave us the biggest slack by forgiving us. But the issue sometimes we, we, we allow greed or anything else is that we become jealous. And when we become jealous, like we see someone more blessed than us, or oh, the guy gets to drive the latest car, or the guy or the woman gets to own the latest dress, or or the new Jordan that just uh, that, that just got released. And when, when we allow jealousy to, to come in, we're gonna like turn against one another. It's, but we have to realize that we have to behave according by being forgiving. Because if we don't, we run into the risk of blaming God turning into and turning into a miserable, horrible human being. Let's watch this video of two capuchin monkeys. Uh, on how they behave. What we did is we put two capuchin monkeys side by side. Again, these animals, they live in a group. They know each other. We take them out of the group, put them in a test chamber. And there's a very simple task that they need to do. And if you give both of them cucumber for the task, the two monkeys side by side, they're perfectly willing to do this 25 times in a row. So cucumber, even though it's really only water in my opinion, but cucumber <laughs> is perfectly fine for them. Now if you give the partner grapes, the, the, the food preferences of my capuchin monkeys correspond exactly with the prices in the supermarket. And so if you give them grapes, it's a far better food, uh, then you create inequity between them. So that's the experiment we did. Recently, we videotaped it with new monkeys who had never done the task, thinking that maybe they would have a stronger reaction, and that turned out to be right. The one on the left is the monkey who gets cucumber. The one on the right is the one who gets grapes. The one who gets cucumber, note that the first piece of cucumber is perfectly fine. The first piece she eats. Uh, then she sees the other one getting grape, and you will see what happens. So she gives a rock to us. That's the task and we give her a piece of cucumber and she eats it. The other one needs to give a rock to us. And that's what she does. And she gets a grape. And she eats it. The other one sees that. She gives a rock to us now, gets again cucumber. She tests the rock now against the wall. She needs to give it to us. And she gets cucumber again. <laughs> so this is Sometimes, actually many times we behave like a capuchin monkey. The, the, the cucumber that God gave us, we actually said, God, why is that guy getting a grape? We do the same thing. In fact, I do more. Why do I get a cucumber? And guess, and, and what do we do? We throw it at God. Guess what? We will never know the situation that that person is in, and even God knows the situation we're in. We will, sometimes we will never find out. Maybe you are diabetic. You, you can't eat the grapes. You have to eat the cucumber. But what, what do we do? We throw the cucumber back at God. Or even worse, if, if that cage, if that dividing wall was, was removed, the monkey would probably go and attack the monkey that's got a grape. And that's sometimes the picture that we see of, of ourselves today in the world. Don't, ju don't just talk about the church, just talk about the world. Because we, we, we feel that sense of injustice. And I think there's something good too. But we must also realize that we live in an imperfect world where sometimes justice or fairness is not necessarily real or fair to all of us. But it's how we respond. It's how we respond. And that's why God says that you have to forgive. Let me sidetrack with this because, it, and then for those men who have attended um, the, the encounter where I shared on the topic of forgiveness, 
And there was a revelation that came fresh to me on that day, and I thought I'll, it might be relevant to you. For those who have read your Bible from cover to cover, from the Old Testament right to the New Testament, in the Old Testament, God never tell, tell the people of Israel to actually forgive anyone. It was actually literally an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. But suddenly Jesus appeared in the sin, uh, in, 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 hum, in human history. And that's where things changed, where, go, where he made an, one of the new, new commands for humanity was to actually forgive people. Why is that so? Why did the Old Testament, there was no mention that you need to forgive, but it's only in the New Testament. Because actually, God realizes that it's impossible from our own human ability and resource to actually forgive someone. Think about it. Someone hurts you, cuts you at the traffic light. What do you do? You point the half piece sign? No, you're going to point the wrong half piece sign. Why is that the natural inclination? Because there's our human corruption that we can't do it. But because when Jesus came, and what he did was that he provided the greatest forgiveness and resources to do it. That's why he's able to institute it, to make it a command, saying that you forgive now, not because out of your own strength, you forgive out of the forgiveness that you receive from me. Jesus is saying, so you actually forgive out of God's resource. So don't try to forgive people by your own strength because God never required of the people of, in the Old Testament. But now he requires it because you have Christ to forgive you and to enable you to do so. That's two number four. Two number five, verse 14. Do everything out of love that binds all relationships in perfect unity. Remember in whatever we do, the words we're going to say, the action we're going, we're going to act upon. Stop yourself and ask the question, is it coming out from love? And love, what I mean is God's love, selfless love. Love that sees, that wants the best for someone, wants the best out of the situation. Do we do it? Because if we do, if we start doing it out of love, not only would it get a better outcome, but it actually keeps us all together united. Because if imagine a family with no love. It won't be a family shortly. And I don't want to harp too much on this two number five. Two number six, verse 15a. Allow and release God's peace in our hearts to act and be at peace in God's church. As a community of believers, all of us are not perfect. And we are all on a journey of perfection. But peace is something that you can't describe. But something that you have to only experience when you, when you ask God to give it to you. It's almost like when, when you allow God's peace to reign, it gives you that sense of calmness, even though the world around you is crazy, to actually be clear-minded and, and be rational about it. It's, it's nothing spiritual where suddenly you, you, you feel that, oh, God has given you something that you can overcome everything and, and that you have supernatural power, like Black Adam in its most uncorrupted state that is able to, to defeat anything. No, it's not that. Peace is that sense of calmness that you know what is right and what is wrong and you are able to make the right choice. There's God's peace in your life. That's two number six. Two number seven, verses 15b and 17. Be thankful and grateful of what God has blessed us. Instead of whinging, complaining of what we want and we don't have. Because we need to let gratitude inspire us in what we do. And not just inspire our attitude, but inspire our words. Do you actually say thank you? Do you actually mean it? But also inspire our actions too. Like, do you need to buy that stuff? Do you need to pursue that? Be thankful. Be grateful. It's a very underappreciated tool. And, and what it does do is that it actually changes your worship towards God when you are grateful. And the final two, two number eight, verse 16, let the gospel of Christ change us to bless others. The gospel is good news. We need to let good news change us so that not only that changes from the inside out, influences, shape us, so that we can not only change the world around us, but continue to bless the people around us. Because as we do it, 
We are able to share and build each other up with all wisdom through personal and corporate worship with genuine gratitude. A church where, where the gospel doesn't change and impact us is a powerless church. It's a, dis- and a, a church that lacks unity. Our corporate worship will just be a showmanship. We just do things out of it. But the gospel has to change us so that we can change the world. And the question is, do you, do you know the gospel? And if you know the gospel, is the gospel changing you? But now let's come back to, to, the, first, to, to the first question that I asked you. How are you going to invest your resources for eternity? Is it going to be, is it going to be for eternity or is it going to be something for, with limited value? But also this question or this statement is what we invest in demonstrate the state of your heart. Like, and and one, one thing people say that, oh, the world, we, we need more money because money makes us happy. But let, let me tell you this truth that I learned from, from, from a guy who, who is a Christian financial in, um, planner or investor. He says that mon- what will mo- money will only do this, do this one thing to you. It will amplify who you are as a person. If you are a mean person, it will make you even meaner. If you are a kind person, it will make you a kind person. So we have to ask ourselves, Currently, what am I? What I'm investing in? What is? Does it describe the state of you, of my heart? Most of the time, it's true. But I also want you to know that the truth is, guess what? With any good investment you're gonna do, you need to know how to invest. And I'm I'm keeping it really simple. The truth is that God and people made in His image are the only two things with eternal value in this life we live in. So whenever we invest in something that has got eternal, with limited value, like even you say that, why do I need to learn this math in school? Why do I have to do this terrible job serving customers that are not grateful? Why do I have to do that? Like you feel that this thing doesn't have any eternal value. Then you ask yourself this question. What, if, what I'm doing now in this investing in this limited temporary thing in my life, does it have an eternal value to help me to connect to God? Does it have this, et- this eternity that will help me bless someone for eternity? You have to ask yourself that. There's always a need to have some relation connection to God and people. And let me give you an example. We provide acts of mercy in, in a mission war. Not because like, yeah, we, we've got nothing better to do. But to, but to let people know that they matter to God. They are, they're empty stomachs. Their lack of education, their lack of uh, resource in terms of hygiene, a home to stay. We do that. Guess what? To show that actually God cares for them. And that way they know that, hey, God is real. Let's put it down to something a bit more at home. Why do we, why do we even bother like, spending time with our children or with our loved ones? Is it because we, that's my obligation as a, as a parent? No. It's because I actually care for them and I want to buy relevant, meaningful gifts for, for my children or for my loved one so that they know that, hey, guess what? My earthly father or mother is like God, the father who actually loves and cares for me. And that's why we do what we do sometimes. Even though you say, oh, it's not spiritual, you know, it's not holy now. But always have that eternal perspective that what I'm doing now is going to impact something that means to God, but also means to someone's eternity. And finally, as I, as I invite the band up to, to finish up, um, investment like anything else, we need to have a clear, and clear motive and wisdom in doing it well. With God, we need to know His heart and His mission. We need to know His heart and His mission. Because there's no point trying to do things for, for God when we do not know His heart. But we also need to know His mission. Because His mission is about action. And action means something. Action is tangible. Then what we do, we ask for His wisdom, His guidance, His provision in our personal circumstances. We, we, we have to stop and say, no, 
It's my circumstances. The, the resources I have right now, God, I know your heart. I know your mission. God, in my resources, what do you want me to do? I need your help. I've got debts that I'm struggling to pay off. Or I've got that relationship that is, that's annoying me or that relationship that hurts me deeply. But God, I'm I want to invest something that means, that means something for you. And, and you ask that question and say, God, I need it. I need your help. I need, your, I need you to guide me as to what I need to do. And when you ask that, and once you, 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 you know, you know, like in a race, you run in your lane, you swim in your lane. You don't care what was happening around you. So that you are able to win that race. Because you need the focus. So we need to ask that question. What, God, help me to focus my resources through my current circumstances. And as, as all of us do that, even, even though we are running in our own lane, because as we focus, God will align us. And as He aligns us, there's that unity. And when that unity combined with all the focus energy that we are running and we are playing our roles, like in the team, everyone has got a, a place to play in the, in the position that they are being put into according to their strength. If you're a goalkeeper, you're not going to be put as a striker and a striker, you're not going to be put as a defensive midfielder because that's not your strength, that's not your lane. But when you run in your lane and align with God, He will put you together. And what do you see? You see an exponential multiplication of the impact of the investment because it's our collective investment that comes together of our time, our resources. Because I, I want to... I want to take this thought away from us that it's not about money. Because I know next week you're going to say, oh, the church is interested in money. But it's about our resources. What is in your hands? What is in your hands? But guess what? What is in your heart? That's a lot more important. Are you greedy? Are you doing it because you want to be better than uh, Christian B here who is, uh, who is giving more? No. You do, he, you do your part, he does, he or she does her part. And when we harness it all together, we see God multiply it. Not for your glory, remember? God is not going to publicly go and declare, say that, oh, so and so has done this, so and so has done that. It's for his glory, for the expansion of his kingdom. And I want us to, 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 to take that to heart that, that the eight tools that we have shared that I've just shared, that we need repentance. We need to put to death the, the, the things that is not right. And we need to put on the new self. And also we need to leave out who we are, who we are, not what we want to, but who we are in God. And also to be forgiving. And let God's love, peace, govern us and His gospel shape us. And that's God's desire for all of us as we close this time. Let's, let, let's close our eyes in prayer. Lord, we know, Lord, I've done my bit to, to share your word, to share the bit that you've imparted, but I know that it's not just me telling, telling my brothers and sisters and friends that this is what they are doing and I'm better because, I'm, because I, I've got it. No, God, this word speaks to me as much as they are speaking to them. And I know, Lord, in where we are at right now, we need your help. And if there's something, if, if there's a conviction in us that what we have been doing is wrong, Lord, let it be a gentle, firm voice of yours that you, you're coming to us about this truth, not from a condemning heart, but from a loving heart that wants to bring us back onto the track that you want us to. Lord, we want to seek your ways and we want to seek you, God, in whatever you're calling us to do. And Lord, most importantly, we want to invest. We want to invest in, in eternity, in the lives of the people that matters to you and to the things that matters, Lord, to, to your heart and your mission. Help us, O oh God, to make that step. Help us, O oh God, to realize that and really put it into action. 
Lord, even for all of us, Lord, for those of us here, Lord, in the midst who don't quite know where we stand with you. God, I know that you, you love them and you care for them and you really want to reach out to them. And hence why you give us the greatest news and the, the best news, Lord, that's called the gospel in Jesus. It's not just a, a theory, a message, but it's a message that's linked to the person, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the one that has given it all, that has made it real for us. Lord, if, if, any, if, if any of them, Lord, is, is making that decision, is not quite sure where they stand, Lord, I ask that you work in their hearts even right now. With our eyes still closed, I just want to give you a privacy of your time. This feels seconds. If, if you, you are in that position where you say, I'm not quite sure where I am with God, and you start to realize that hey, I'm actually investing in the wrong thing in my life, and it's, guess what? It's, it's, it's probably going to, if I continue this way, it's not going to make any sense because it's going to be failed investment. But now you have the chance to actually say, God, I want... You have the chance to say, I want to make it right. I want to make this right investment right now. If you are in that position that he says that, I want to make the right investment by coming to the investor of my life, Jesus Christ. I just want to close in a um, short prayer. Then I'll, I'll hand it over to, to Matt to, to finish us off. Lord, we know that um, today is, is a, it's a special day, a new day, new truth, new message. But God, we know that you're real. Speak to us the truth of, of, the rea of the reality of who you are and help us to know who we are in you so that we can make wise, meaningful, truthful, genuine investment choices, Lord, in our lives. Not for our glory, but for your glory. And help us, O oh God, if we are struggling with any of this thing, in the area of greed or anything else, a lot, or even unforgiveness, or even a particular challenge that we are facing, or doubts that we have, help us, O oh God. Help our unbelief. Help our, our sense of powerlessness and give us hope and give us your strength. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Hi, everyone. I hope you enjoyed the message today. Do you know Jesus as your Lord and Saviour? I want to give you the opportunity today to think about this. There are five things that everybody deserves to know. First one is God loves you. God loves you and he has a plan and a purpose for your life. But of course, sin has separated us from God. It separates our relationship with him and we want to be back in relationship with him. But the third thing is that God sent his son, Jesus. He sent him to die on the cross to take the punishment for our sin, the punishment that should have been ours. And the fourth thing is that we get to make that decision to repent of our sins, ask for his forgiveness and ask Jesus into our life. And the fifth thing is that when we do that, we enter into a relationship with God himself. And our future is secure. When we die, we go to heaven. But even more than that, every single day, we live empowered by him. He helps us live the life that we were designed to live. So if you'd like to make that decision right now, let's. why don't you pray this prayer with me wherever you are. Lord Jesus, I thank you that you have a plan and a purpose for my life. I understand that I'm a sinner. And I repent from all those things that I've done wrong and I've sinned against you. Please forgive me, Lord, for those things. I ask Jesus that you come into my heart. And from this day forward, I choose for you to be my Lord and my Saviour. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer with me today, we want you to make contact with us. Why don't you go to the link on the website right now, it's below, and fill out a connect, a connect card and let us know. We'll be in touch because we all need support on our Christian walk. And in fact, if you want to know anything about In Church Melbourne, you can go to the website, you can fill out the connect card and there's heaps of information and people, someone will be in contact with you to help you out. The other thing that I want to tell you is if you'd like to give your tithes, your offerings or donate to In Church Melbourne and what we're doing, 
You can also do that via the link below using the Tithely app. You can do EFT. It's really, really simple. Do you know that every week on at 10 a.m. at Burnside Community Centre, we meet in person, we meet live, and it's fantastic. And, of course, online church is great, but it's better if we can meet together. So I hope to see you next week at Burnside Community Centre, 23 Lexington Drive. And do you know we also have a fantastic kids ministry? While you're in church, your kids can be also learning about the love of Jesus out in Kids Church. So I hope you have a great week and I wonder if you would consider going on this journey with us this year where we make it our goal to please him. 